President of the United States escorts the Japanese Premier for a notable ceremony in the East Room 18 years after Pearl Harbor. <laughs> On any major changes in the deployment in Japan of American armed forces. <laughs> the beginning of a new relationship as Japan takes its place as equal partner in the free world community. On Wednesday, August the 4th of 2011, the United States Forces of Japan, the USFJ, released the first volume of a four-part manga that they had been working on. The manga was released as a PR stunt to commemorate the 50th anniversary of the controversial U.S.-Japan Alliance Treaty, which permitted the U.S. to set up strategic military bases on Japanese islands for the purpose of mutual protection. We'll take that with a grain of salt. Written entirely in Japanese, the manga seeks to educate the Japanese population about their historic alliance with the United States and to explain to them why they have so many military bases on their soil. While it was initially scheduled for December of 2010, the release of this manga was delayed by months. In a deeply ironic and completely tone-deaf fashion, its release was rescheduled for August the 4th, 2011, just two days prior of the 65th anniversary of America's nuclear attack on Hiroshima. While sources say that the reception of this manga was mostly positive, I am hesitant to agree. From the unfortunate date of its release to its anticlimactic, devastatingly unhumorous excuse for a plot, I doubt the Japanese people fell for this blatant PR stunt. To express discontent, many users went to 2chan, an online Japanese messaging board, calling it, quote, Aryan propaganda, and saying that the manga, quote, about sums up America's contributions to the world, stealing the best of our crap and attacking less powerful nations. And they're right, because the U.S.-Japan alliance is a deeply unequal and exploitative treaty. I mean, despite only being 0.6% of Japan's landmass, 75% of U.S. forces in Japan are stationed in the island of Okinawa. Of the five main islands, Okinawa is the smallest and least populated. After the defeat of the Axis powers in the Second World War, the U.S. controlled the area up until 1972, and 30,000 troops remain stationed there to this day. Since 1960, residents of Okinawa have protested the massive military presence of the United States. Not only do they feel it is an unjust use of their land, but they've been victims of numerous accidents and crimes by American forces for decades. To properly dissect the propaganda pushed in this story, we will examine both the historical roots of the military bases in Japan and the use of soft power diplomacy in maintaining them. Hey guys, uh, just a brief little interlude. I opened up a Patreon, so I'll put the link down below. You can support me there if you want better quality content and more content. Um, I would greatly appreciate it. Thank you so much. On September the 2nd, 1945, Japan signed the official document declaring their surrender. And just a few weeks later, they were occupied by the United States. Germany was also occupied by the Allied powers after the war. However, Japan's occupation was supervised almost entirely by the United States. While Great Britain, Soviet Union, and China held advisory roles and were part of the Allied Council, they didn't have any real say in the occupation's direction. Instead, Japan's reconstruction lay entirely in the hands of General Douglas MacArthur. In some aspects, the first few years of U.S. occupation were kind of productive. They quote, quickly dissolved the Imperial Army and Navy, issued a civil rights directive, abolished the notorious special hire police, passed a new trade union law to protect workers' rights to organize, initiated a radical land reform that would end rural tenancy, and introduced a purge of wartime leaders and ultranationalists that eventually removed 200,000 people from public office." End quote. Only two years into their occupation, MacArthur managed to virtually transform Japanese civil codes, dismantling the patriarchal family law, reconstructing Japanese education, and decentralizing the government. Expectedly, reforms such as these allowed for a growing leftist labor movement in the country. 
However, as the U.S. became increasingly absorbed in the Cold War, MacArthur began to crack down on Japanese labor movements that could possibly aid in the spread of communism. So in the very American fashion, on July of 1948, General MacArthur issued the Government Ordinance 201 that denied public servants the right to strike or collectively bargain. Furthermore, when MacArthur gained intel that the Sankabetsu Labor Federation was planning to do a general strike, the government prevented it from happening, just a day before it was scheduled. What's also important to note is that, to this day, Japan abides by a constitution almost entirely written by Americans. Appropriately nicknamed the MacArthur Institution, it is a distinctively American document. For example, it divides government power into three branches, the executive, legislative, and judicial. It also institutes very Republican principles. While it does provide extensive civil liberties, even going as far to have more civil liberties than the United States, its ninth article is deeply controversial. It states, quote, The Japanese people forever renounce war as the sovereign right of the nation and the threat of use of force as a means of settling international disputes. In order to accomplish the aim of the preceding paragraph, land, sea, and air forces, as well as other war potential, will never be maintained. Mind you, this article was written in 1946, just a year after the end of World War II, and when the main interest of the Allied powers was still demilitarization of the formerly authoritarian powers. When it was put into effect in 1947, however, tensions between America and the Soviet Union began to rise, and their priorities began to shift. This anti-war article suddenly became a problem for the United States because when the Korean War broke out in 1950, Japan couldn't legally be used as a military asset. I mean, Japan is really close to South Korea. It would be a perfect strategic base. So instead of abiding by the constitution they created, the United States formed the National Police Reserve. Their justification was that since they had to transfer U.S. troops that were stationed in Japan because of the occupation to South Korea, the country would be defenseless. Despite the end of the Cold War, the National Police Reserve still exists today, but has been renamed to the Special Defense Forces. Since it was established for the sake of internal security, the existence of these forces is technically constitutional, and to this day, Japan is in fact able to maintain some kind of army. The San Francisco... In 1951, Japan was forced to sign a treaty that ended the U.S. occupation, on the condition that the U.S. was allowed to maintain military bases on their islands to defend their interests in East Asia. To add to this, despite the fact that they were essentially going to exploit Japanese land for their own economic interests in East Asia, America made no provisions of defending the country if they were indeed attacked. This treaty also states that American troops were allowed to put down domestic protests should they arise. Needless to say, this agreement was deeply unbalanced on the side of the Americans and was vastly unpopular both domestically and internationally. To make matters even worse, the CIA later proceeded to prop up the Class A war criminal Nobusuke Kishi as the next Prime Minister of Japan, because he pledged to stop the leftward shift in Japanese politics. Unsurprisingly for the US, if it meant preventing socialism, even a war criminal was better suited to run a country. No doubt about it, most Tokyo people do not want the new security treaty between Japan and America. Outside Parliament, they demonstrated against it, hoping to stop the government ratifying the treaty. It gives the U.S. bases 10 more years to stay in Japan. In 1960, with the U.S.-backed Kishi in power, the American and Japanese governments oversaw the revision of the unfair 1951 treaty. The revision process sparked the ANPO protests, some of the largest protests in Japanese history, because, hey, a war criminal was revising the unfair treaty. How much more fair could this treaty actually get? After years of occupation and nuclear buildup on both sides of the Cold War, the Japanese people wanted the peace and demilitarization that was promised in the initial occupation. But it was 1960. America was meddling in Vietnam, and China was now under the control of Mao Zedong. Mid-20th century American politics in Asia were consumed with the pursuit of global capitalist hegemony, 
And the Japanese knew that the Americans were not coming to dismantle the treaty altogether. So they took to the streets. Quote, At the climax of these protests in June of 1960, hundreds of thousands of protesters surrounded Japan's National Diet Building in Tokyo on a nearly daily basis. And large protests took place in other cities and towns all across Japan. End quote. The Empo protests were harshly suppressed, but this did not stop the movement because, quote, on June 15th, protesters smashed their way into the diet compound itself, leading to a violent clash with the police. During the confrontation, a female Tokyo University student, Michiko Kamba, was killed. In the aftermath of this incident, a planned visit to Japan by US President Dwight D. Eisenhower was cancelled, and Conservative Prime Minister Nobosuke Kishi was forced to resign. While the Enpo protests did gain nationwide popularity, it ultimately fails on its initial goal. Because the revised Treaty of Mutual Cooperation and Security between the United States and Japan was put into effect on June of 1960. While it did make several revisions to the unbalanced nature of the initial document, the US was still permitted to use Japanese land as military bases. Fearing a second wave of protests, the Japanese government sought out a policy shift to retain any semblance of legitimacy. They needed a way to redirect attention from this deeply exploitative agreement. So they shifted towards a consumer based economy that connected national development to domestic consumption, rather than military independence. So instead of being defined by their military power, Japan sought to assert their influence through their economy and culture. In order to get this going, they needed a miracle. The US needed to take the eyes off of their exploitation of Japanese land, and a miracle was what they got. It's no coincidence that from the 1960s to the 1990s, Japan's economy shot up so high that it became the second largest in the world, right next to the United States. I mean, at that point, who cares about a few military bases in your country when you're a global economic superpower? Joseph F. Nye, a renowned scholar of international relations, was the one to coin the term soft power in the late 1980s. Soft power describes how nations will indirectly exert their influence in the world through culture, ideology, or economy. By the 1980s, people were traumatized by the horrors of war and nuclear power. The militarism and violence of the 20th century sparked so much civil unrest. That exerting power through violence was no longer an effective way of maintaining control. Joseph Nye argues that soft power is exerted alongside hard power, as a complement, not a replacement. According to Nye, Japan is a key example of how to exert soft power diplomacy. When you think of Japan, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Anime, video games, J fashion, and cars, but I bet it's not the 30,000 US troops currently stationed in the tiny island of Okinawa. I bet it's not the fact that Japan is considered a de facto nuclear state that has the means necessary to produce nuclear weapons within a year if they wanted to. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the effectiveness of soft power diplomacy. A little personal anecdote I have for this, because I'm a huge fan of anime and Japanese culture. So, last year, when I went to Anime New York City, I witnessed soft power diplomacy happen right before my eyes, and it shocked me. Sneakingly placed amongst the Hello Kitty plush toys and manga artists was a recruitment booth dedicated to the Marines, who were challenging cosplayers to do as many pull ups as they could. It's just so shockingly out of place that I had to go up and ask them why they were here. I'm sorry to the Marine I talked to. I'm, I'm just autistic and very interested in this stuff. I was asking him, like, why were Weeaboo's targeted demographic for recruitment? I knew that enlistment numbers were at an all time low, but seriously, at an anime convention? <laughs> in response, a Marine told me that they had bases in Japan and that lots of Marines were weebs, but this didn't exactly answer my question. If it was the answer to my question, that's a. That's a A little concerning because if it only takes you to be stationed in Japan to enlist in the army, Joseph Nye was right. Japan really is the emblem of soft power diplomacy. 
The manga released by US forces in Japan is a prime example of an attempt to exert soft power. Whether or not it worked is up for you guys to decide. From 1945 to 2011, 350 crimes were committed against the women of Okinawa by US troops. Furthermore, reckless military activities have devastated the environment. Quote, in 1959, the US military accidentally shot a nuclear rocket into a local harbor. Six years later, it lost a hydrogen bomb in nearby seas. Then, in 1969, a League of Nerve agent on the island so shocked the world that President Nixon was forced to renounce his nation's first use policy on chemical weapons. Aside from these awful accidents, military infrastructure is devastating sea life, causing pollution and disrupting the local fishing economy that the people of the island depend on. Locals are faced with high unemployment rates and a lack of economic investment. In the months surrounding the publication of this manga, Prime Minister Yukio Hatoyama resigned because of his inability to move U.S. Marine Air Corps off of Okinawa, and a nuclear power aircraft carrier was in the process of being moved to one of the naval bases. The military is a naturally violent entity that needs PR to remain in power. So how did they choose to navigate this? Through manga. Our alliance, a lasting partnership, was created with the intent of familiarizing the Japanese citizens with their diplomatic ties to the US. They needed some way to justify their massive military presence on islands such as Okinawa. Nearly all branches of the US government in Japan were involved in publishing this story. From the Ministry of Defense to the US Embassy, which is a really funny picture to paint in your mind. But anyways, this story centers around two main characters that are meant to represent the two allied nations. Representing Japan is Arai Anzu, or Miss Alliance, an ordinary looking Japanese girl with long dark hair and glasses. Representing the United States is USA Kun. Yes, his name is USA Kun. I can't believe I'm saying this out loud. Anyways, yeah, yeah, I know what you're thinking. He's probably being represented by a strong white man with rippling abs um, who's there to save the helpless Asian girl. You know, typical white savior trope, blah, blah, blah. What's new? But no. The United States, aka USA Kun, is a young boy with big sparkling eyes and bunny ears. The largest imperial power in the world was represented by a cute chibi character. I mean, what's weird was that they didn't have to go this route. Because not all anime is drawn in such a deliberately cute fashion. They very well could have gone with the style that represented Baki or Berserk. And there is a large viewership for those kinds of manga. So why did they choose the cute route? While portraying yourself as strong and powerful is one way of establishing your authority, portraying yourself as cute and helpless is 10 times as lethal because you don't expect it. According to Sabine Firstuck, my apologies if I mispronounced that name, I'm so sorry, quote, in this specific manga, the embodiment of complex configurations such as military establishments or nation states in two children also help further the desired innocent character of their characters, and by extension the institutions that they stand for, as well as to minimize, dehistoricize, and flatten these very configurations." End quote. These books are, unsurprisingly, riddled with propaganda. So let's break it down together. In the first issue of Our Alliance, Yusei Kun arrives at Arai Anzu's house, telling her that he's here to protect her from the cockroaches that riddle her home. Cockroaches and pests in general have historically been used to portray a perceived enemy in a conflict. During the Rwandan genocide, the government portrayed the Tutsis as roaches who did not deserve your sympathy. During the Holocaust, Germany portrayed the Jewish people as vermin. And the United States is no stranger to this tactic. During the Second World War, political cartoons depicted Japanese immigrants as rats, bats, and many other kinds of vermin. You see, it's easier to get away with violence when you dehumanize the enemy. Major Neil Fisher, the PR director who oversaw the creation of this manga, disagrees. According to him, quote, So he saw a roach, and he killed a roach, and it was as innocent as that. But in this political military environment, this highly political environment, the roach meant something. He continues by saying, quote, I promise you it's totally innocent, but what people read into is what they read into. Considering America's history and morality, 
This is hard to believe, and I wouldn't be surprised if the cockroaches were meant to represent countries like North Korea and China. Let's be honest, who else are they meant to represent in East Asia? Anyways, the brave USA coon, armed with simply a rolled up newspaper, saves the squeamish Japanese girl from the pest, and the two henceforth form an everlasting friendship. How utterly adorable. <laughs> A little tidbit of uh, lore here, USA Kun was initially supposed to be armed with a more lethal weapon, but the PR team decided that a newspaper would look less threatening. You're not being slick, bro. You're not being slick. So as the two characters grow closer, they realize that they have more in common than they initially thought. Turns out they both love freedom, democracy, and human rights. Oh my god, what a coincidence. In this bonding arc, they also attempt to make some kind of joke about mutually hating carrots, but it doesn't land whatsoever. I mean, they try to make this a slice of life type of manga, but god, there was just no attempt to make this in the least bit funny or entertaining. This was a tough read, guys. Anyways, in the manga, the different branches of the US military were represented by cute girls with no personalities. First, there's US Army-san, who is meant to represent, wait for it, the US Army. <laughs> She's a small but determined character and can get kind of lonely sometimes. Crown Defense Self-san, who is meant to represent the Japanese Self-Defense Force, um, doesn't really have a personality, but hey, together they make a team. Throughout the story, small propaganda fact bubbles explained by anime girls uh, occasionally pop up to explain what the story cannot. You know, they conveniently dedicate a very small percentage of these fact bubbles to the bases of Okinawa, despite the fact that they are like the majority of US bases. And this is because even cute anime girls uh, would have a difficult time justifying the exploitation of Okinawan land. In its mix, the US sought to make it as authentically Japanese as possible to appeal to their target demographic. So they worked alongside the company Hobby Japan and the Japanese mangaka Hirai Yukio. It's interesting that they chose Yukio for the role, considering that he made another manga just a few years prior that portrayed the US military, specifically the marines, in a completely different light. Magical Marine Pixel Maritan is the name of this manga. It's about Maritan, a magical girl character who is meant to represent a mockery of the US marines. Maritan is abusive and derogatory towards her inferiors. So much so that I can't show a lot of these manga panels even if I wanted to because there are a lot of slurs. There are panels in which Maritan completely humiliates her inferiors, going as far to tell them to lick the boot, an acronym commonly used to mock those who overly respect authority figures, such as the military and soldiers. According to Fristuck, quote, at least when viewed next to the more recent work of the artist for USFJ, it almost seems as if Hirai had played a prank on them. And I'd have to agree, because if you compare this manga with the manga he wrote later on, it's hard to understand why they hired Yukio to work on this project. Interestingly, even though it's popular amongst the marines, the USFJ has explicitly not condoned the Maritan manga for reasons you can probably um, assume. After reading the roller coaster ride that was Magical Marine Maritan, the watered-down attempts at humor in the later manga seem almost intentional, as if Yukio did not put in the effort into making the characters likable or even interesting. Of course, I'm not going to make any assumptions about the mangaka because who am I to know what's going on in his head, but the difference between those two stories is something we should think about. What's even more important to think about, however, was why the US forces felt like they needed to publish this manga in the first place. Why did they need to go the soft power route and portray themselves as cute and innocent? Well, since the Anpo protest that we discussed earlier in 1960, there has been a prominent anti-base movement on the islands. In her article, Fighting for Okinawa, My Home, Not a Military Base, Moe Yonamine, a former resident of Okinawa, brings light to the massive resistance movements led by the residents of this island who conveniently never managed to get adequate media coverage. In the 2010s, despite decades of protest for the complete removal of all US bases on the islands, both the US and Japanese governments announced that they would be building an artificial floating military base off of the coast of Henoko, 
Of course, there was massive popular resistance to this decision. Residents, quote, marched for miles down main streets, creating human chains for peace, linking arms around military bases, elders repeatedly lying down in front of bulldozers. Despite complaints of environmental damage and general popular opposition, the federal court overruled local pleas against the military presence, and these protests were barely covered. To Yonamin, one of the main causes of this unchecked military power is ignorance. Unfortunately, most people, even those who support global anti-imperialist movements, are unaware about Okinawa's situation. Most people don't know that Okinawa was once an independent kingdom that was colonized by Japan in 1609. Most people don't know that after World War II, the island was occupied by the US from 1945 to 1971, even after the US stopped occupying the rest of Japan. Most people don't know that today it is a Japanese prefecture that is neglected by the federal government and overrun with military bases. Yonamin then proceeds to tell the readers, quote, When people say to me, why are Okinawans complaining? We're there to protect you. I want them to learn our whole history and to know our colonized story. When people ask, why don't Okinawans complain to the Japanese government? I want them to know about the history of our people's movements to demand our rights. When people say, so what, it's just one little island, I want them to know this is my home. It's sacred. These are my loved ones. What's more, our story of struggle today represents issues affecting so many island people. Yonami does not blame the people for their ignorance. She blames the textbooks for neglecting the history of the island and media conglomerates that can't even dedicate a minute of their precious airtime to covering Okinawan resistance or struggle. To fight against this, Yonamine is part of a network of teachers that seek to develop a new school curriculum that seeks to fill in the gaps of our propagandized history books. I highly recommend reading the full article. I am going to link it down in the description. Um, it's super interesting and much better put than my summary of it. Many Cold War historians argue that the Cold War never ended, that it's still an ongoing problem. I would argue that the military occupation of Japan never ended. After watching this video, I hope you guys can understand where I'm coming from. So far, diplomacy is a weapon deployed frequently by nations in the 21st century. With access to so much media all the time, culture has become the most effective means of warfare. However, most PR campaigns are not as detectable as this manga was. The blatant propaganda is what makes it fascinating in the first place. They didn't even attempt to cover it up. I mean, I personally love video games, movies, and manga, but I try to be careful and critical with the media I consume. I recommend asking yourself, what narrative is the author trying to push? And why do they have such a narrative in the first place? I mean, why would the US government put money into creating a manga of all things? I swear they will put our tax dollars into anything but healthcare. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode of Why America Sucks. Expect many more to come. As always, stay informed, stay hydrated, and stay subscribed to your favorite federal agent. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye bye. Thank you to all the patrons who were able to make this video possible. I wouldn't have been able to do it without you guys. Thank you.